so nervous. <laughs> no idea. I, I can now totally relate to Brené Brown's wonderful talk about vulnerability. And um, I've got some slides that I'm going to share with you. I needed to kind of put something together to keep the, the arc of the story, um, you know, to, to, to enable it to flow. Um, and I've worked on these slides since last weekend, and right up until an hour ago, I was still throwing things in and taking, you know, adding things and taking things out. So I'm going to share a story with you um, that I've shared with friends of mine that know me intimately, obviously my family. Um, I'm not going to touch on what I do really today, my work stuff. It's just it's what I do. I'm going to share a story with you about my life, my formative years, um, and moments that have really defined me as a person. Um, okay, let's see where we go. So I thought about what do I call this. Um, I wasn't going to use slides, actually. I mean, I saw the great talk yesterday by the two young ladies from Ireland, and it just totally blew me away. Um, I'm still actually in awe of what they shared with us. It was truly remarkable. Um, but I thought, no, I'm going to use slides. So my talk is called What Matters, What's Possible, and What's Important. So I'm, I'm 54. I grew up in Hull, up in the northeast in the 1960s and 70s. It's kind of a rough, tough fishing, <coughs> fishing port, fishing city built on the fishing industry. Went into a huge economic decline. Um, it was a really, 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 it was an interesting place to grow up. It was very, very, family was really important. You know, grandparents were a big part of one's, one's life. And, but it was a tough place to grow up. Um, um, it was industrial. It was, you know, you, you, you felt um, a city that was really deeply rooted in the, in the industrial age. You know, it was still a dirty, all the buildings were covered in black. Uh, these buildings have now been cleaned up, and they're beautiful, but they were covered in black, which was from the smoke and, you know, from all of the, the, the stuff that was, that was, you know, falling out of the sky. So we talked today about, you know, the environment, but back in, back in the 50s and 60s and probably even earlier, it was, must have been terrible for people. Um, but, you know, living in this rough, tough city, I fell in love with the bicycle at a very, very young age. As a real little boy, I, I loved the bicycle, and... You know, there are photographs of me on a bicycle dressed up as a cowboy and dressed up as, you know, like Batman from being a real, real little boy. And eventually, um, I realized that the bicycle was, was my, like my little freedom tool. It was my way to escape Hull and get up into the Yorkshire Wolds and the Yorkshire Moors and into the Yorkshire Dales. And eventually, I figured out that with youth hostels, you could actually get to the Lake District under your own steam. And this was like a revelation. It, it was a real sense of, of freedom. Um, and I kind of kept going with the bike. And eventually, I started racing bikes. Um, and I was, I was kind of really, really determined to kind of, yeah, like I'm very competitive, you know. But I, I kind of raced my bike and started to get reasonably OK. And then eventually, um, um, I, was, I was training to be a chemical engineer. Um, and, and I quit all of that uh, because I was given the opportunity to go race um, and get paid to ride bikes in Europe, which was quite a big deal. So I went over to the Netherlands, you know, with, with my bags and my bike and all my wheels and things. Um, and I went over there as this innocent kid, um, you know, who kind of fell in love with the bike because it, it was, you know, this, this tool to freedom, this thing that took me to beautiful places away from Hull into the countryside, basically, into nature. Um, and things went really bad for me when I, when I, you know, when my ambition kind of got a hold of me and um, I, I kind of wanted to be really successful on a bicycle. And um, I kind of found myself um, uh, exposed to the dark side of sport. And we talked today about the dark side of sport as, you know, Lance Armstrong and doping and all this kind of stuff. Um, and, and I've been there. And um, I, I can tell you that, that the drugs do work when, when, when the doctor gives you this stuff. But I had a huge moral dilemma with it, like really serious. Um, 
it got to the point where I hated my bike, I hated racing, I, I was looking for excuses all the time not to get on the bus to go to the next race because I just didn't want to do it anymore. Um, and it got so bad that, um, and this is how I met my wife, I came back to the UK to ride some races and I had a preparation that I'd been given by the team doctor and it had a real adverse reaction on me, like really, really bad, and I had to get rushed to the hospital. Uh, I was in a real, real bad way, actually, and, um, and that's how I met my wife. My wife was the nurse that, that took care of me. Oh, really? No, for, for real? This is, this is more than 30 years ago. Um, and it was a real, really difficult emotionally to try and understand what was going on. And I knew what was going on, but I didn't know how to stop. And the only way I could stop was to stop racing my bike, to take that out of my life. Because my ambition to want to succeed and to, to realize my potential was so huge that I knew that I was prepared to go a long way. And I knew that to ride at the level that you had to ride at just to get a place on a team, it was really hard to do it with, with you know, porridge and pasta and all the rest of it. It's, it's, it's very, very sad when you, when you realize what, what it's like. It really had, it broke my heart, really. But I then kind of, I quit the bike. I, I had to stop doing it. Um, and, I, and I came up with all, all sorts of excuses as to why I didn't want to race anymore. And I was, you know, I was newly married, and that's wonderful, because you fall in love, and it's, it's a beautiful thing. And, and I, I kind of just drifted away from cycling. And, I didn't really ride a bike at all from 83 to the early 90s. I just completely divorced myself of everything to do with the sport. Nothing didn't have anything to do with it at all. And then from kind of 83 to um, 89, I, I found myself, um, and once again driven by this, this energy and this focus that I have, I found myself working um, for Lloyd's TSB in the world of financial services and broking. Um, and I just channeled all the energy from cycling into something else. Um, and they trained me. And then I just channeled all of this energy. And, and I, I, I kind of realized that um, I was in a world where you could earn a lot of money, like really a lot of, a lot of money. I've got a wife who's a nurse. And I'm out going out doing this stuff. And in, in an hour or in a half a day, I'm earning the equivalent of what she was earning in a year. And it was really crazy. And I got really into this, really, really into it. And, and I, I kind of call it that my lost decade, when I just kind of lost touch with all the things that are really important in life. Um, and I had a meltdown kind of towards, right towards the end of the 90s where um, I, I didn't want to do, the, do it anymore. The, the money was, was, was actually not a good enough reason to get out of bed. Um, so I quit, I quit that world completely um, and started riding my bike to get my health back. And a chance encounter um, and reading a book um, opened up a whole new world for me. So I, I read Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey. And this was all before the internet. You know, this is still late 90s. There's no, no internet at all. And I read The Hero's Journey, and I could really relate to it. I could see myself in the book. It was like, oh, my God, it's like... It's talking to me. It was really reaching out to me and giving me a lot of inspiration to um, believe in myself and not try and put on an act and not try and live up to an expectation that was unrealistic. And a chance encounter with a cyclist um, um, led to something that um, was really cool. Um, I was introduced to some nutrition technology that was being used by the British cyclists preparing for um, the Barcelona Olympics. And this includes Chris Borden, who eventually won a gold medal in 92 on, on that Super Lotus bike. And they were using some really cool nutrition, but this nutrition wasn't commercially available. And I kind of saw this opportunity to, to kind of do something with this nutrition that would enable cyclists to realize the potential using nutrition, which was always my dream. I knew it was possible, but I didn't know how to do it. And then I saw a way. And in 1991, um, I started a company called Maxim Sport Nutrition. Um, and, and at the time, it was, it was the first of its kind to bring kind of real functional sport nutrition into the European market. 
Um, it was kind of in America, there were two brands. There was Cliff Bar and Power Bar doing it quite well. And we launched this brand. And I'd never launched a brand before. I never do any of this. I don't have an MBA. I don't have any of this stuff. No business plan. There was nothing. All there was was a, knowing that there was a need for cyclists to have something that was really good. And within a year, we were the official energy fuel of the British Olympic team. We could use that in our marketing. Um, and the business grew really, really quickly, like really, really fast. Within two years, we were exporting to 17 countries. I was traveling all over the world just talking about the product. And, and it was a social network before social networks existed. This was 92, 93, 94. Um, and this business really, really took off, um, really took off. And it was amazing, the feedback we were getting from people. It was just quite remarkable, actually. Um, but then I, that business was, it was, was acquired. It's like we talk now about exits and all that kind of thing. I, it wasn't in my frame of reference, but a big company bought it. Um, and it was amazing. I thought it was a, a prank call when I got a call from somebody. <laughs> I thought it was my brother <laughs> calling me up. And they said, no, 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 we want, we want you to come and see us. And, and we, we, we love what you're doing. And we think we can make it really big. And so they did. And... I kind of sold the company, and this was at the, right at the end of the 90s, and then I did kind of the dot-com thing for a while, and that was cool, but the bandwidth wasn't there. So I had all these wild ideas, but you just couldn't make them real because there was no bandwidth. It was still dial-up, and it was you know, trying to build something that's like an amazing user experience on, on WAP. It was just ridiculous. <laughs> it was a joke, but it was great fun. And then you know, the dot-com thing all fell apart, and then I, I connected through the internet, I read an interview with a real senior guy at PepsiCo called Brock Leach, who, who's, who's become real pivotal in my life. And he was talking about PepsiCo of this need to want to do something really good with their portfolio and change their image and, and develop a whole new range of products. And, and I read this interview, and I was developing a nutrition platform for kids at the time. And I went online and I found the number for PepsiCo's front desk at Purchase in New York and I called the number and got through to this lady on the front desk. No, really. And, and she, she said, oh, um, I, I know Brock's personal assistant. I'll pass your message on. And he always calls people back and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, yeah. This guy's PepsiCo's chief innovation officer. He was the CEO of Tropicana. Like, but he called me back. A day and a half later, I got this call from this guy. Hi, it's Brock. You want to talk to me? Oh, Brock who? Yeah, Brock <laughs> from PepsiCo. So the first call was like two hours just talking about value system and the things we believed in and our passions. And within half a year, I'm, I've gone from living in the Netherlands, I sold my company, I've got really long hair, I'm doing really cool stuff. And PepsiCo basically said, how do we get a guy like you in the company? I said, I don't know. I'm not a corporate guy, and I don't do that. <laughs> but I, I went to North America and took my family with me, and, and for, for three years, I was part of this team at PepsiCo, real, real high level, developing their future strategy about how, how do we do this? How do we become more entrepreneurial? This was before lean. It was before MVPs. None of this stuff existed, but we were doing it. How do we find these companies that are cool and bring them in and, and, and do cool things and attract cool people. And it was amazing. It was an amazing experience. It was something that I never thought would ever happen. And I never had any ambition to want to do this. It just kind of, yeah, the stars lined up and I thought it would be cool. And, and, it, and, it, and it was really, really amazing. Um, and I remember uh, Indra Nui, who's now the CEO, um, um, you know, she didn't want me to become like all the MBAs they had in there and all these, you know, corporate rock stars. She said, you're different. We've brought you because you're different. Keep wearing the T-shirt and be, just be yourself because we don't have people like you. We don't even understand people like you, but we know we need you. So I did. And for three years, I did this crazy, crazy thing and, and sometimes went on the corporate jet and it was just like completely unbelievable. It was like having a, an out-of-body experience at times. <laughs> it really was. And then... In, 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 in 2005, um, my, my dad, um, he died, um, and he was quite young, and he was my coach when I was a cyclist, and we did real cool things together. I, re I remember kind of like 1969, my dad had a VW Beetle. I mean, 1969 is a long, 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 long time ago, and not many people had cars. 
And I remember him, my brother, my, myself, my brother, and my mum, my dad saying, we're going to go to Ullapool. I was like, where the heck is Ullapool? I mean, it's way up in Scotland. And we looked on the map, and I thought, I, 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 it was like another world. And we drove. He drove us, like, took days to get up there. We ended up in this place called Ullapool, like, in the northwest of Scotland. It was like, I can't believe these places exist. It was just, like, the most amazing adventure. And, and it was just remarkable, really. So, you know, when my dad passed away, and, and, he, and he died of, 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 of multiple myeloma, um, a cancer. It was, it was really, 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 really tragic, actually, to see, to see this happen. And I, I, I kind of couldn't go back and do this corporate stuff anymore. It was just irrelevant. I couldn't go back and do the PepsiCo thing. And he asked me a, a real loaded question, actually. Um, he said, what do you want to do with your life? And Without hesitation, I said, oh, I want to make the world a better place. I felt, I felt almost like a Miss World. Remember when Miss World used to be on? It's like, well, I kind of want to help children and make the world a better place. So, God, I'm not a Miss World, but I feel like one. But I really did. And he said, well, look at me. I, I, you know, we were going to do these cool things when I was, you know, when I was going to be 17. It's never going to happen. I'm going to die. He said, if that's what you want to do, you've got to walk out of here and you've got to, got to figure this out. And, and I kind of carried, carried that with me, and I had no clue what to do. I felt so confused, especially when he passed away. It was like, he's gone. Um, so I got back on the bike. I, I started racing again. I was living in America, and, and, and the bike was my way of grieving. I used it as a way of grieving. And from the bike, I developed an idea with a Canadian called Bicycles for Humanity that's gone on to become the biggest platform in the world for sending bicycles to, um, to Africa that are just in people's basements. We've sent about, I think it's about 150,000 bikes so far. We have a whole infrastructure now in Africa. We even sh turn shipping containers into empowerment centers with solar panels, and it's amazing. And then, and then this photograph really, really, it was in a newspaper actually, and it really, really resonated with me, made me, I wanted to do something more. So I set something up in the US called the Ziozi Foundation. I wanted this cool word that was different, and I wanted to have a foundation where people would want to put the sticker on the surfboard. And it was just about youth empowerment. And I connected with so many young people, and people started sharing stories with me about, you know, oh, you know, I've, I've thought about committing suicide, or, you know, people, this young woman, I remember write, writing this letter to me about how she'd got out of Somalia and she'd been gang raped by soldiers and it was like, now she's a doctor and it was like, I'm not equipped to deal with letters like this. It's like, why are these people writing to me? But, and they did and it was really beautiful, but it was really also, um, I was like part of this grow, growth process that we go through and you realize that you set up a website and you start getting out there and you start to really connect with people and it comes with really huge responsibility. And then I was living in Chicago and I was there during that, that entire Obama campaign, the Yes We Can, and I got really inspired by this. And, and I'm not really politically active, to be perfectly honest with you, but I just saw this campaign by Obama and it was really grabbing the attention of young people and they were using social media and I thought, wow, there's real hope in this. It was amazing. And then, you know, the Occupy movement came, and that was pepper sprayed into oblivion. So that, that movement never really got anywhere. And that was a bit, bit sad, really. And, you know, the Arab Spring has kind of led, you know, I look at the Arab Spring, and I think, well, that was amazing. And now we've got ISIS doing all this madness. How that, what the heck is going on? I get really confused by some of this stuff. And, you know, these slides really are just about people coming together and the power of people, the power of community, and the power of what's possible when people come together. And then, you know, we had the Ice Bucket Challenge, which, you know, it ended up being people just wanting their two minutes of fame without even referencing the Ice Bucket Channel Challenge and the ALS and this, you know, entire you know, fear, of, fear of missing out. And I'm just going to transition now to some things that I think are really important. You know, we all use kind of gadgets and phones and, um, you know, things that, that are capturing our movement. And, and I kind of developed something last year called um, the Nordic Data Empowerment Initiative. And um, I'm the entrepreneur in residence right now at Lund University, which is really cool. But part of this work meant that I had to kind of research the world of data and what's really happening and, and, and you know, is it, is it safe or dangerous? 
And you know, the, the Snowden revelations revealed quite a lot about you know, how deeply rooted this is now in society where you know, your, your iPhone or your Android is just basically connected to this social graph and you know, everything is being captured and eventually one day when we've got the technology it's gonna be used. So I kind of stumbled across something that really blew my mind. Um, it's um, an organization called Incutel. And Incutel is a venture fund but it's the CIA's venture fund. Oh, for real. They have a venture fund. And they, they invest in, in companies that are developing data solutions, apps, things that are, that are part of what, what's needed to capture more of our data. So they fund these startups. And then the startups are usually rolled into one of the big five players out there. So a big piece of what has happened is that a lot of the stuff that is going on is coming from Incutel funded startups and it's now embedded in Facebook and Twitter and Amazon. It's, it's totally unbelievable. It's, when, this was a real revelation to me and it really scared the shit out of me. And you, know, you realize that you're maybe, we're maybe a generation away from this, for real. But it doesn't have to be like this. It doesn't have to be like Skynet and, and, and you know, AI out of control. But it is possible that this could happen. This is not a figment of our imagination. It's not delusional. It's, it's possible that if we don't understand the power of what we're creating and, and manage it correctly, this could go terribly wrong. And that really, really, really makes me very worried. But I don't think it needs to be like that. I think, I think we need a change in attitudes. We need to think about things in a different way. And I think what we need is a cultural revolution. I really believe that we're suffering from a compassion and integrity deficit. I really, really feel this. And I think this matters a lot more to us than we dare to admit. I think here we're amongst friends and it's really cool to have these really, these conversations that you maybe wouldn't otherwise have. Um, and, and as I'm kind of thinking about talking to you today, I'm kind of thinking, well, what's, what's our moonshot? What is, what is it that we want to do? What is, it, it, what is our moonshot? You, know, you see Elon Musk is wanting to take people to Mars and you know, he's coming with the, the solar revolution and the electric revolution. And he's a true, true visionary, this guy, but there aren't enough of him. You know, I was in a building a few days ago where there's like 3,000 people in London startups and they're all just building apps and most of them, if they just didn't go in the next day, it wouldn't make any difference. There's no... No purpose. They've got tons of passion, like huge amounts of passion. I mean, people with so much passion, it's unbelievable, but they don't have the purpose of like, that's what we're doing and that's why. Um, so I, I wrote something a few years ago, 2008. It was actually after my dad died and it's, it's set in 2040 called Discovering the Obvious. And the first scene is actually quite similar to where we are now. And, and I wrote this, it's never been edited. I once had it up on a wiki and then the wiki site closed down, but I kept a copy of this as a PDF. And the opening scene is just like being here. It is literally, it's on a farm called Broadview in 2040. And these four characters who have taken on this journey in this, this kind of book that I've written, um, um, are sat having a, a breakfast and this huge airship flies overhead completely silent and it's taking people from New York to Seattle and it takes a day and a half because we don't have to rush anymore. The, the whole, this whole world of the internet of everything, it changes the way we think about why we need to get somewhere fast. We don't because we're everywhere all the time. So travel is like being on an ocean liner but you're flying. And I vividly remember, remember writing this and I don't know where it all came from but I wrote pages and pages and pages and pages of this. And you know, I believe that images like this are, 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 are not possible. Images like this are going to happen. This is our future. We can make this a reality, and it's not going to be politicians that make this a reality. It's going to be people that just say we've had enough, and we, we're going to do something. So I think the greatest opportunity for us is to come together in what I call safe spaces. We need safe spaces to discuss these things and to create momentum. And I don't think these safe spaces are, are social networks and, and, and places online. I think the safe spaces are cow sheds and safe spaces are hikes with people where you can talk and, 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 and start to get the conversation going. I think we've become overly dependent on, on you know, posting stuff on Twitter and setting up a group on Facebook and it's, it's not gonna work that way. 
So, you know, I believe it's about finding your true believers, sharing everything with them, asking who's going to step up and stand for a cause, bringing people into a fold, bringing people into do, and empowering people to lead. It's like this open source. You just, it's like deploying a virus and then empowering people to go run with it around a big moonshot. You know, Martin Luther King never said, I need a strategy or I need a business plan or I need to do a business model canvas. He never, he just said, I got a dream. And that was it, and that was enough. And Gandhi, he never said, I can't do this because I don't have an app. <laughs> he, he didn't. I need to send out five million text messages, otherwise I can't do it. He didn't. So my, my, my call to action is really, really important, actually. My call to action is a hashtag. I, I think it's possible to start revolutions in new ways, a social revolution. and. My, my kind of call to action is, even though I've just said it, it's not about technology, is let's s deploy a hashtag and let's set a moonshot vision and say, we've got 25 years to create that image. We can't, this is, you can't do this, it's short term. It's so challenging what we're facing. But my challenge is in 25 years, I want to leave that as a legacy for my, for my kids and my grandkids. And when I'm getting older and I'm in my 80s and 90s, I want to be able to feel that a group came together and it's hundreds of millions of people and we just left politics over here to do their thing and we just did our moonshot and we created something that can only come from people. And that's my talk. Thank you.